Let's go. I've lost the pencil to the new toy already. Okay, here we go. So tell me if you can see this. And I'm getting used to the pencil, so hopefully it'll be a little better. That's okay. So hopefully the writing is going to get better. Okay, so we proved a bunch of things. One, um, so we define this class of functions. This is holomorphic on uh, the strip. So imaginary part of Z less than A. So again, here's minus A, here's A, here's this strip. I want a function that's holomorphic on this range and has the extra condition that uh, there exists some constant so that for all uh, y at most a and for all x and r, what's the condition? What kind of decay do we want? Uh, C over one plus x squared. Exactly. So this is called moderate decay. Moderate decay is we have some polynomial decay that's better than one over, you know, one over x. So this is moderate as opposed to exponential or super exponential, moderate decay. That's all we've, that's all we've been assuming so far. So this is the class FA of functions of this form. Let's see. Ah, okay, don't play around too much. Um, you get a new toy, it's, it's very hard not to play with it. So FA is this class of functions, holomorphic on this, on this, uh, on this strip and uh, satisfying sort of a uniform bound out at infinity that it decays like one over X squared. And in the Y direction, well, there's a compact range. So it's just independent of Y. So far, so good. And then uh, we set big F, the Fourier class to be just anything that's in one of these FAs. And we proved a number of theorems. We proved a number of theorems. So theorem one, uh, we show that if you have something in this class FA, then in fact, the Fourier transform, not only does it exist, I mean, it exists because you have this decay rate, uh, but it itself has a decay rate and that decay rate is quite a bit better. So for any B less than A, you have a decay rate of E to the two pi B C. And this was by pulling contours up and down depending on whether C was was positive or negative. We'll call the proof whole contours. And uh, using similar ideas of pulling contours, we showed that if F is in FA, then the Fourier inversion holds. Fourier inversion formula, which is, uh, of course, F hat of C. You did this thing. Oh, I didn't say what f hat of c. Yeah, so f hat of c by definition is the integral f of x e to the minus two pi i x c dx. Fourier inversion is that if you take f hat of c and you multiply by, you integrate against e to the two pi i x c with a plus sign instead of the minus sign. Oops instead of the minus sign, you have a plus sign, then this integral, which is now an integral dx, recovers the value of f of x. Okay, this is familiar. This is what we did previously. Okay, good. Um, we're ready to go to Poisson summation. Let's do Poisson summation. So here's a fundamental, this is like, for me, a fundamental theorem of duality with the, the, the first hint uh, of, of something much deeper. So here's a theorem. This is Poisson summation formula. So this says that if you have something in this class, Actually, it's much more general than that. You don't need this class as I'll, as I'll describe in a second. Then here's a funny thing to do. You take the function and you evaluate it on the integers. Okay, so you have your function. I mean, 
it's a it's a holomorphic function, but let's look at it on R. So this is f restricted to the reals. Whatever it looks like, it decays like one over x squared. So I'm going to evaluate it at zero. I'm going to evaluate it at one. It doesn't have to be positive. It could be negative. Okay, it could be complex. So I add up all of these values on the integers. Or I can take the Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform is some other function. I mean, it, it has similar properties. And I take its values and I add that up over all of the integers. This is okay because the Fourier transform, why is this, why does this integral, why is this sum, I gave it away, why does this sum converge? The Fourier transform is integrable. Yeah, it's uh, not, yeah, exactly. It's integrable. Also, it's, it has exponential decay. That's what we just showed up here. So there's no problem making this number. There's no, no problem making this number. These are two complex numbers. And the Poisson summation formula says that these two complex numbers are one and the same. And this is a fundamental, this is our first uh, hint at, so this is a first hint at some kind of duality. In fact, this is the first version, maybe I'll talk about this. This is the first version of a trace formula. This is a baby trace formula. In fact, maybe that's a good thing to do. Let me think about this. Maybe what I'd like to do is um, go a little off script and tell you about why this is a trace formula. I'll give you the standard proof as well. Um, but maybe that's a good thing to do because it'll slow us down. We're not going to have any homework problems on the trace formula. Uh, but it will give a chance for people to see some, some other stuff. I think this is a good, this is a good chance to um, see some other stuff and slow, slow down the progress of the, the usual course. OK, so let me, give you, let me give you three proofs. So the first proof, so proof one, which will be, um, I think the most elementary one. So this will not use the fact that it's in FA. It'll just use the fact that it's sort of smooth and integrable. So let's say F is uh, just smooth on R and integral so that I can form this thing. And being smooth, remember, means that we have polynomial decay. In fact, two derivatives would already give us uh, enough decay to ensure that this sum exists, right? So we talked about, I mean, when we, uh, wrong button. when we talked about this, this is exponential decay. So this exponential decay, exponential decay, as opposed to, which is much better than just super polynomial, which we would get from being smooth by integration by parts. I'm just reminding you of that, that bit of the conversation. Right? You guys remember this? Good. So now I'm saying, okay, all I know about it is smooth. That means the Fourier transform by integration by parts uh, twice is uh, integrable, which means that this sum makes sense. This sum makes sense because it's an L1. So let's see what we can say about this. So I'm just going to use, okay, so let's uh, define. I'm going to use much less than complex. And this is not really complex analysis right now. Uh, I'm going to define a, an automorphized function, f of x, which is you take your little f and you translate it by n, and then you sum over all integers n. Yeah, there's a good reason most books will have a sum over the integers n is equal to the Fourier transform of the sum of the integers n. These are completely different variables. Uh, what I claim is that this is a geometric variable. It's n on this side. It's, it's z on this side for a completely different reason than it's z on this side. This is a spectral side. This is spectrum. This is geometry. Uh, I'll explain what I mean by this. Right now, it's just words. OK, so we have this function f of x. Can I define such a thing? Right, the function's in L1. So for every value of x, this converges. So this is a nice function. It's continuous. Um, 
So what can I say about F? F, big F, lives on, is a function on, is well-defined on, well, it's certainly well-defined on the reals. I can put any real number here. But it's well-defined on a, on a smaller space. I guess um, the interval is your one. Yeah, it's well-defined on the circle. It's well-defined on the circle because f of x plus 1, if I replace x by x plus 1, all that does is shift the integers around. So we, we get the same value as f of x itself. OK, does that make sense? So this is well defined on the circle. Well, the nice thing about a nice function on the circle is that we can use Fourier analysis on the circle. So by, by baby Fourier analysis, by sort of baby Fourier, f of x is equal to a sum over the integers, f hat of m, e to the 2 pi i m x. So e sub m x is e to the 2 pi i m x. Right, all this is saying, well, where, what should f hat m be? It's the uh, projection of f onto the nth basis vector of the Hilbert space, let's say L2. So yeah, maybe we'll, we'll throw in a little bit of Hilbert space theory. Have you guys seen, so L2 is a nice Hilbert space, L2 of the circle. This is a compact, compact thing. So there's a nice Hilbert space. There's an inner product on the space. If I have two L2 functions, I mean, what does it mean to be L2 on, on the circle, right? If you're, the circle is compact. So if you're bounded, you're automatically in every LP. Okay, maybe you're blowing up, but so maybe you're blowing up at zero, like one over X or something. I mean. So nice functions are automatic fun functions like this, this F, this is a continuous bounded function defined on the circle, right? If, if, uh, if the original F looks something like a Gaussian, then big F looks, well, it's, it's a Gaussian that spikes at every integer, but on zero to one, it's just some nice smooth curve like that. Okay. So what is the inner product on this space, L2 of R mod Z? If you have a, if you have a function space like L2 R mod Z, what's, what's an inner product on, what do I mean by this inner product? Integral of FG. Right. And I want to systematically use R mod Z here and not zero one. And well, I want a sesquilinear inner product. I didn't say they have, they take real values. So we put an F there, a G, a G bar there. Sesquilinear, have we talked about? Yeah, I think so. Sesquilinear means it's linear in the first variable and it's uh, conjugate linear in the second variable. So this is one and a half linear, sesquilinear. So it's linear. Um, the inner, this, this, uh, this Hermitian product. Um, F, it's linear in F. But if I stick a constant in front of G, what comes out is not the constant, but the conjugate of the constant. So it's half linear, uh, conjugate linear, conjugate linear in G. So a real value pulls through, but an imaginary value pulls through with a minus sign. Okay, whatever. Um, Great. So we have this Hilbert space, and and there's a natural action on such a such a thing. So of course, L2 with respect to Lebesgue dx, Lebesgue measure, comma dx, and uh, there is a natural operator on on such a thing, or at least on smooth vectors here. The natural operator is the Laplacian. 
And what is the Laplacian? What's the what's the Laplace operator trying to do? Have you guys seen any of this? Well, we've seen the Laplacian on uh, R2. So this is the same thing. The Laplacian on two is two derivatives in X plus two derivatives in Y. There's no more Y here. So the Laplacian is just two derivatives in X. Okay. And what are the eigenfunctions invariant under translation? So what, what are the eigenfunctions of the Laplace operator on R mod Z? If you're invariant, so I'm trying to solve the differential equation dxx f is equal to f is equal to lambda f. Hopefully you guys know how to solve this, the sines and cosines. So in general, you have some exponential function or linear combination of exponential functions. But the only uh, linear combinations of exponential functions that are invariant under R mod z are sines and cosines. So in particular, uh, f is equal to one of these e to the 2 pi i mx's, or a linear combination of, of these. So f is of the form em. Um, and so what is the Laplace eigenvalue of em? I take this e to the 2 pi i mx, and I differentiate with respect to x, that brings down a 2 pi i m. I differentiate again with respect to x, that brings down another 2 pi i m. But I'm still left with the original function. So what's the eigenvalue? Other than Sriram. Um, who can I pick on? Kailash, are you following um, any of this or have I gone too far off on a tangent? Uh, would it be minus four pi squared n squared? Perfect. And notice that this is always negative. Well, or zero, if uh, E zero is the constant function, right? We should have known that by the way. So this delta, delta, is a self-adjoint uh, negative semi-definite, I guess, negative definite operator. So what? why is it self-adjoint? If I have the inner product of delta f g, right, what does that mean? Again, it's integral over R mod Z, two derivatives in X, F, G bar. Well, what do I want to do when I see an integral like that? Part. Yeah. Integrate by parts. So this is negative. There's no boundary. R mod Z is, has no boundary. So there's no boundary component. I'll move one of the derivatives from F to G. And if I move one more, I get two minus signs. So now I get a plus sign, F, two derivatives of G. But that's also the inner product of F with Laplace G. Okay, so this moved from one side to the other. So it is its own adjoint. So it's a self-adjoint operator. Why is it negative definite? Well, we, we sort of, we solved this differential equation, but there's actually a general reason why, which is similar to this for negative definite. Let's notice that the inner product of Delta F with F, if I just stick in F equals G here, this is negative the integral of DF DX F times DX F bar which is of course negative the integral of dx f squared. So this integral has to be positive or zero 
if the derivative is zero, then the constant, then the function is constant. So this is a negative definite operator. Okay, does this kind of make make a little sense? It's real. So, um, what do you mean by negative definite operator? Yeah. So negative definite, I want to know what the spectrum of f is. So the spectrum of f, uh, spectrum of delta. So so spectrum of delta is the set of all eigenvalues with multiplicity. You see these, well, these eigenvalues have multiplicity two, because a plus m and a minus m have the same eigenvector. In fact. This is a second order differential equation. There should be a, a, a two dimensional space of solutions. And so E M and E minus M have the same eigenvalue. So it's some, it's some constant E M plus some other constant E minus M is a general solution. But of course we can just break these up into individual solutions. They'll have the same eigenvalue. So the spectrum is exactly the set of minus four pi squared M squared as M ranges in the integers. And this, so the spectrum is negative definite. But the kind of uh, functional analysis way of saying this is, well, suppose f was an eigenfunction. If f is an eigenfunction, then Laplace f brings out lambda f. And now I have the inner product of f with itself, which of course will be positive. So, so I want to know what the eigenvalues are. So this reads off. So if it's a general statement having nothing to do with eigenvalues, but if f was an eigenvalue, uh, eigenfunction, if f is an eigenfunction of the Laplacian, so lambda uh, delta f is lambda f, so the inner product of delta f with f would be lambda times the L2 norm squared. So this, of course, is always positive. So the question is, what do we know about the spectrum? And the answer is, we know a priori that the spectrum is going to come out to be always negative even though we can, in this case, we can compute everything explicitly. This is like the baby case of a much more general thing that I'm, I'm trying to plant some seeds for much later, okay? So anyway, so one way of interpreting this fact, this baby Fourier transform, is that this Hilbert space with the Laplacian acting on it is diagonalized so is recovered as combinations of these EMs, M and Z. This is an orthonormal basis for H. If, if M is not equal to M prime, then the inner product of these is zero. Each of these has inner product one, so it's orthonormal. So this forms an orthonormal basis. These are an orthonormal basis. that diagonalizes the Laplacian, um, this orthonormal basis diagonalizes Laplacian. OK, does that make sense? So this is like you have some big vector space. OK, it's infinite dimensional, but never mind. Pretend it was just a, 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 some r to the n. And you have some matrix. And that matrix is its own transpose. And it's definite. You know that all the eigenvalues point one way. So you could change it by a minus sign if you want to make it positive definite. It doesn't really matter. Then abstract nonsense tells you that there's a way to diagonalize the operator, that this matrix is diagonalizable, which means there's a, there's a basis, orthonormal basis of eigenvectors that uh, recovers the space. So this is like an infinite dimensional version of that. I don't know how much functional analysis people have seen. This, this, is, this won't be on the quiz, okay? There's no, this is just for fun. This is just for your, for your general knowledge. So, okay. So that's kind of my reinterpretation, not my, it's a reinterpretation of the fact that we have this baby Fourier um, analysis, baby Fourier transform. So let's go back to what this means. So again, what is this Fourier transform? It's this inner product. We know what the inner product is. It's uh, integrate over R mod Z, um, big F of X, E to the two pi I, M X bar. So there's a minus, it's really minus two pi I M X. 
dx. So far, so good. I mean, relatively speaking, I realize this, this conversation is not, uh, I'm not taking the time to do it to do it justice. It would be a whole other subject. Okay, so here's what we want to do. We have a function, and remember how f is defined. F, by definition, we have this definition. where we took little f and we averaged over the integers to get uh, big F. Number theorists can't help themselves. They say average, even though you can't divide by how many integers there are. So we just say average when we mean sum. Sorry, that's the terminology. We changed the word average. Um, so let's put that into what we know about uh, big F of x. The problem is the integral, you see r mod z, the nice thing about writing r mod z is I don't care which do you mean zero to one? Do you mean minus a half to a half? Do you mean minus a half to zero and then a half to one? I don't care which domain, which representation, which fundamental domain. So this is independent, independent of choice of fundamental domain. Because this function and this function are invariant under Z. So I don't care which, which domain you choose. But what I'm about to do is replace this by its defining function. And then I lose the invariance under Z. So what I want to do is replace this by a choice of a domain. So choose some domain. Choose, choose some fixed domain. OK? So we have this fixed domain. So um, let's put in, we have this domain and let's put in what F was. Big F is a sum over all the integers of little f of X plus N, right? That's this shift. And then we have E to the minus two pi I MX DX. This is analysis. You have, a, you have two sums, a sum and an integral. They're both sums, or they're both integrals, whatever you want. What are we supposed to do? Yeah, good. You guys are getting good at this knee-jerk reaction. Switch the order. And you should see already why it's, it's crucial that I not write r mod z here. I cannot write r mod z because this function depends on which fundamental domain you chose. Okay, very good. So uh, this is R mod Z. This is a fixed, uh, so this is a fixed domain, like zero to one. Uh, we have this little f, which is not, has no invariance. And then we have this, this thing. Uh, what's a nice change of, uh, change of basis? Change of, not basis, change of variable. So let's replace X by, other than Sriram, uh, Thomas? Uh, like say y minus n? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's probably the, the right way to do it. I'm too lazy okay, to yeah. use the same <laughs> variable. If, uh, if you're used to this, great. If you're not used to it, write x is y minus n so that this, this gets, gets killed off. So, so what do we get? This is equal to a sum over n integral f of x e to the minus two pi i x minus n bar. dx remains dx. And what's the domain of integration? We used to integrate over zero to one. So the values that were here went from n to n plus one. But now they go from, well, whatever we say, we want them to go from n to n plus one, which means we want this domain, this domain to get shifted by n. Does everybody see that? What do we know about this? This EM is invariant under translation. The EM really does live on R mod Z. 
So it's invariant under this translation. And now look, there's no n here, there's no n here, and there's no n, no n's. So we've taken our function, we've multiplied by e m x bar, and we've integrated, let's say from zero to one, but shifted by n. So this is an integral from n to n plus one. And then we get the sum over all n. So you're integrating over n to n plus one, and then n plus one to n plus two, and then n plus three to n plus four, and so on. So this is the same as integrating over um, Anna. The whole real line. The whole real line, beautiful. The whole real line, f of x and e m x bar. Again, that's e to the minus, because it's a bar, two pi i m x dx. But what is that? Yeah, you guys see? That's just the Fourier transform of little f. Okay, so all of this, this entire discussion, got us down to the following, the following thing. And remember, that was f hat, f hat of m, big f hat of m. Let me write it, let me write it again. Big f hat of m. This is a different hat. This function lives on the reals. So when you take its Fourier transform, you integrate over the reals. This function lives on the circle. So when you take Fourier transform, you integrate over the circle. Okay, so we have this big f. So we had this big F of X. We defined it as a sum over the integers of F of X plus N. This is a function on a circle. So it's recovered as an inverse Fourier transform of its Fourier transform. Right? This is saying that what we really did up here, if you want to think about this uh, as a vector space, I mean, that's exactly what we were saying here. We're taking this F, we're projecting it onto this orthonormal basis, and we're writing it as a function of whatever the projection was times the basis vector. So you have this infinite dimensional vector space, you project onto each of the EMs, and then you add them all back up and you get back to the function. So that's baby Fourier analysis. That's, that's a view of baby Fourier analysis, okay? So, so that's right here. And we just computed, this is called unfolding. What we just did has a name, this process has a name, it's called unfolding. We sort of, we took the real line, we folded it up into a circle to get this big F, and then we unfolded it back out. We had a sum over R mod Z, we have an integral over R mod Z, of a function that's defined as a sum over z. So when you unfold the two, you get back to an integral over r. So that's this unfolding technique. And uh, the unfolding technique told us that the Fourier transform of big F is the Fourier transform of little f on the real line, E m x. Now we're almost done. set x equals to zero. This is what I mean by they're, they're different integers. This integer is not the same as this integer. So they have completely different roles. This is the geometric integer, uh, the geometric integers. Here we get a sum over n in z, f with no shift, x is zero. n, and what about here? We get a sum m in z, f hat m with no twist e to the two pi m x is zero so times one and maybe i'll write this maybe i'll write this as plus zero just to emphasize the different roles that they played and that's the the plus on summation formula okay so, so one more time, 
what we were trying to show, we had this little aside in Hilbert spaces, which uh, I'll come back to in a second, but we were trying to show this, this formula on a function. We, we, used a, we didn't use any complex analysis. Let's do the complex analytic proof. I'll give you three proofs. One is just to introduce the ideas of Fourier analysis in the language of functional analysis, where, which is where the general uh, version of this duality principle lives. Um, let's do a complex analytic proof. Any questions on the kind of baby Fourier proof? So far, so good. Okay. Let's do proof two, complex analytic. Here we go. Proof two. This is complex analysis. Oops. Complex analysis. Okay, so again, we're trying to show we want f of n summed over the integers is f hat m summed over the integers. This proof kind of hides. That's why I don't love this proof. Yes, it's a complex analytic proof. The course is complex analysis. I'm supposed to show you this proof, but it hides really the general nature of this duality and, and uh, what, it, what it means for me. Okay, so let's look. Let's look at the following function. I want something that's going to catch the integers. And we're going to do this by residue calculus, of course. So some, something that has poles at the integers is the denominator e to the, um, I guess, 2 pi i z minus 1. So let's look at this function, f of z over e to the 2 pi i z minus 1. Look at, I don't know, g of z. Okay, f, f of z is in, this is holomorphic on imaginary part of z less than a. And it has the, the decay property in the x direction, right? So that's f. This thing has, has poles. This has a problem every time this thing is equal to one. e to the two pi i z is one when z is an integer as poles at z in z at every integer. So when we look at an integral, so let's go from minus r to r as usual. This f is holomorphic out to a. So let's take a little b. Let's fix b less than a. And here's minus b. And I want to integrate over this rectangle. Let's say r is a half integer. I mean, let's say r is in z plus a half. So that I, I'm not near any of the poles. Okay, so these are the poles, the integer values. So I don't I, I pass kind of in the middle of, of two poles. Okay, these are the poles. Great, so here's our region gamma, oriented in the usual way. The integral over gamma of g of z, dz, will be the sum, I guess there's a two pi i, all right, I'll put it here, two pi i times the sum of the residues um, at z equals n over all of the integers n less than r of g. So far, so good. So we have to work out what these residues are. So what is we need to compute? Need to compute the residue at z equals n of f of z over e to the 2 pi i z minus 1. Remember the residue formula. These are going to be simple poles. If we didn't know that, we could try the first order and um, see, uh, 
see that yes, indeed, we get a non-zero limit and not an infinite limit. Therefore, it is a first order pole. So these are simple poles, as simple poles. So the residue formula for order one is that you take the limit, so this is the limit, as z goes to n of f of z. Well, this is continuous. There's this I can pull right out of the limit as f of n. And then in the denominator, I have e to the 2 pi i z minus 1. And I take this thing and I multiply it by z minus n. Right? If you remember the residue formula, you multiply by z minus the, the place where you have the z minus z0 raised to the power which corresponds to the pole. Then you take the number of derivatives corresponding, I guess, one less than the order, and then you divide by some factorial and so on. For, for simple poles, it's, it's simple. OK, so far, so good. So really, what we have to work out is what this is, what the limit of this is. But we're getting quite good at these, right? I think. So, so if you want to work out what this is, well, let's look at it the other way around. e to the 2 pi i z minus 1. That is 1. This equals 1 over z minus n. So I've, I've inverted the fraction. This goes to what? It's the definition of the all together now. Yeah, it's the definition of the derivative, right? It's the definition of the derivative of e to the 2 pi i. And so, so this is uh, d d z of e to the 2 pi i z at z going to n. So that's very easy. That's very easy. I know how to differentiate this. It's e to the 2 pi i z uh, times 2 pi i. And now evaluate it at z equals n, which makes that a 1. So exactly as uh, I think Rishab, did, is that who said that? Yes. Yeah, as exactly as Rishab said, the residue is 2 pi i, which means that this thing is um, f of n, uh, 1 over that. So instead of 2 pi i, I get over 2 pi i. OK, so that's what the residues are. We just evaluated the residues. And so let's go back. The integral is 2 pi i times the sum of the residues. So the integral over g. So. Let's come here. So the integral of g on one hand is 2 pi i times the sum over n less than r of the residues, which we just computed, which is f of n over 2 pi i. Beautiful. So that converges as r goes to infinity. Of course, the 2 pi i's cancel to a sum n in z f of n. OK, that's the integral over gamma. Now, the integral over gamma also breaks up into, as usual, this breaks up into an integral over, gamma, over the bottom line, a vertical line, a negative horizontal line. Maybe I'll already write minus gamma 3 minus, and then this gamma 4. Um, should I leave it as an exercise over what happens on gamma 2? Or should we do it together? Take a vote. Who wants to uh, do it? Do it all together. Okay, a couple of people are are saying let's do it together. Let's do it together. So the integral over gamma two. Let's pull that out. The integral over gamma two. So, um, Kayla, I I see you have a thumbs up. Can I pick on you to? Oops, gamma four. Why did I write gamma four? Dyslexia, gamma two. Okay, so again, this this is gamma one, this is gamma two, this is gamma three backwards, and there's gamma four. So here's gamma two. We're going from what is this? R. Uh, I'm doing it for you. R minus i b to r plus i b. So uh, z will be Kayla.
Is your audio not working? Does anybody else want to want to jump in? Uh, Mike, can I pick on you? You want to parametrize the curve from R minus IB to R plus IB? Um, let's see. Um, well, the derivative would be I. Yeah, I just want the, the parametrization. I just want to set it up as a parametrized curve. Um, um, um. So like R plus IY as Y ranges from minus B up to plus B. Does that make sense? Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so that's so that's the the integral. So we go from minus b to b. The function that we're integrating is is this. Hopefully you remember. So this is f of r plus i y over e to the two pi i r plus i y minus one, and then i dy exactly as Mike said. The derivative is i, and then there's a dy. Let's slide that. Okay, so as usual, we want to estimate this away. What do we know about F? F is in that space with moderate decay. So with F, we get some, some constant, some constant one plus R squared. And then let's look in the Y direction. So, right, we have an e to the minus two pi y. So there's an e, there's a one over e to the minus two pi y minus one. This is worrying. This is slightly worrying because y is gonna go through zero. Right, it's an integral dy. And y is going to go through zero, which means this thing is going to go to zero. And we have to check whether that, that blow up is OK. Let's see, you can't see the, the, key, the key choice. It would be slightly worrying. If R, if we really went through one of the poles, we would be in trouble. But I purposefully went away from the poles, halfway in between the poles. So R is a half integer. So what is e to the two pi i R? Is everyone, yeah, okay. So this is minus one. That's, there's not enough room to put, put it there, but there is enough room to put it there. And so if I want the absolute value of this, the absolute value of this is actually one plus e to the minus two pi y. So there's actually no problem with the denominator. This is just some constant depending on b. And that goes to zero as r goes to infinity. Okay, does that make sense? This was a key, a key little insight that we should not let r get close to an integer because then the denominator will blow up and we're gonna have trouble in this estimate. So if we make r a half integer, this sign, the sign of this complex number is exactly in the negative direction. And then we're subtracting one. So what is that in absolute value? This is an, a real number that's non-negative because it's e to the pi y, e to the e to, to something real. So this is positive. Maybe I should point that out. This thing is positive. And then minus a positive number minus one has absolute value one plus that positive number. Okay, so it, it, this is at least one. So one over that is bounded and we're bounded by B or something, doesn't matter. R is what matters and R is going to infinity. But it's not going to infinity smoothly. It's going to infinity as it jumps over each pole, stepping, stepping over the problem areas. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so this integral goes to zero. By the same argument, this integral goes to zero. And so the integral over G 
goes to, on one hand, it goes to this sum. On one hand, it goes to a sum f of n. On the other hand, it goes to a sum over the limit of gamma one, an integral over the limit of gamma one. Gamma one was this, was this region. So let's call the infinite line L1, L1, L1. And this is F of Z over E to the two pi I Z minus one DZ minus an integral over the top line. Let's call the top line L2. F of Z over E to the two pi I Z minus one DZ. Does everybody follow that? So all we're doing is the boundaries, these boundary parts go off to infinity and die. And the bottom parts just go to the integral over the line. And this goes to minus the integral over the line with the correct orientation. So that's, so that's what these two are. So far, so good. Okay. Ah, but now we're getting very close to something good. Um, let me let me draw where the lines are. So line one is at uh, goes through negative i b. Line two, and they're both oriented the right way, goes through positive i b. So what is the absolute value of this on line one? Is this big or is this small? Well, this is, so something on here is x minus i b. So if you take 2 pi i z, in absolute value, the x doesn't matter, but I get a minus, 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 sorry, minus i squared, which is a e to the 2 pi b with a plus sign. And b is positive. So this is bigger than 1. How about here? So this is bigger than one. How about here? What's its absolute value? I don't mean what does it go to? What is its absolute value? Well, the same thing, except instead of minus IB, it's plus IB. So then you get a plus I squared. So you get a minus B. So this is negative. I mean, less than one. Thomas, I lost you. Can you can you see my um is my is the writing clear? I can see. Um what don't you like? I just zoned out for a minute. <laughs> so what are okay. you so, so I get the 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 e to the two pi b is you know that we get that for that term. Yep. Um and then you're saying so this is bigger than one. Right. And this one's less than one. What? I'm going to oh, want to oh, use right, an identity okay, in a I second. See, and the identity will depend on whether the thing is less than one or bigger than one. So I want to know okay, which, cool, cool. which one's going to apply. And the yeah. identity that I want to recall, I mean, is the geometric series. So if lambda is less than one in absolute value, then um, the sum as m goes from zero to infinity of lambda to the m is altogether. Yeah, one over one minus lambda. Good. Geometric series. We all know that. So there's no problem applying that here. In fact, I can put this, this minus sign as a plus minus plus. And there's our one minus lambda. And lambda is less than one. So I can stick this in. So this is an integral over L2 f of z and then a sum over m bigger than zero, lambda to the m. Lambda is e to the 2 pi i z. So this is e to the 2 pi i m z dz. Does that make sense? 
This thing, so are we allowed to interchange orders? This has absolute value e to the minus mb, because we're on this line L2. So this has absolute value e to the minus 2 pi mb. So, ah, uh, it's not quite as smooth as the other thing, but this isn't the product review. e to the minus 2 pi mb. Okay, m is positive. So this in the m direction, it's exponentially decaying. In the x direction, which is what, L, what L2 is integrating over, we have polynomial decay. Either way, it's absolutely convergent. So the, um, this double sum and integral is absolutely convergent and we'll be able to swap them. We'll be able to swap, swap them. Does that make sense? But what do I do on this side? It's bigger than one. Well, if you're bigger than one, just use this same formula, except not on lambda, but on one over lambda. So if lambda is bigger than one, then one over lambda is less than one. So sum over m bigger than zero, lambda to the minus m, that's one over lambda, is equal to one over one minus one over lambda. I'm just replacing lambda by one over lambda in this formula because lambda is bigger than one, so one over lambda is less than one. And this we can simplify a little bit. The denominator is what? Lambda minus one over lambda. So we get lambda over one over lambda minus one. Does that make sense? And we have one over lambda minus one, where lambda is now this thing bigger than one. So this I'm going to apply here, but this, well, almost this, I have to divide both sides by lambda. So let me divide this by lambda and let me divide this by lambda. And this is what I will apply to that. I have a one over lambda minus one where lambda is e to the two pi iz and e to the two pi iz is, is bigger than one. Okay, so let's see what the integral over L1 is. So the integral over L1, I have an f of z times one over this thing and one over this thing is, a, is this sum. So I have an e to the minus two pi iz and a sum over m e to the minus two pi i m z dz. Does everybody see that? Great. So the integral over g converges over g converges to the integral over l1 plus the integral over l2. The integral over l1 we're going to write as a sum m going from zero to infinity, integral over L1, f of z, what do I have here? e to the minus, minus two pi i m plus one z, when I incorporate this guy into this, into this. That's not an z, dz. Does everybody see that? And then how about the integral over L2 plus Again, a sum over the integers or the positive over the naturals, integral over L2, f of z and e to the two pi i mz, dz. So far, so good. Now, this is an integral. So the L1 integral is over this line L1. But we can pull this contour back up to the real line. So let me spare you the details. I realize I blew, plat, blew past our, our break. So this is equal to, 
it's exactly the same argument, right? You have your usual rectangle. And uh, here, there's nothing in the denominator. It's just a nice exponential function. So you shift it up, and you get an integral. And you get the integral over the, the real line. And what is the integral over the, over the real line of this? It's the Fourier transform at m plus 1. Right? f of z, f of x, e to the minus 2 pi i, m plus 1, x, dx. How about this thing? Again, we're going to shift L2 down to the real line. L2 was up here. We're going to shift it down to the real line. There's, again, no problem doing this. And I get F hat at, I guess, negative M, since it was defined with a minus sign. So this will catch 0 and the negative numbers. This will catch the positive numbers. This is equal to the sum of F hat of M over all M and Z. And on the other hand, it was also equal to a sum over f of n, m and z. So that's proof two. Any questions? So these seem like totally different proofs, but is there some like weird hidden way you can make them into each other? The first proof, if reinterpreted as a trace formula, is an extremely general thing. The second proof, this complex analytic proof, is um, very special to nicely complex analytic functions where you can pull contours and catch uh, residues. So at least in my interpretation, they're rather different. They're rather different proofs of the same thing. Um, let's take a, a, a five minute break, just because I promised people I would, and um, come back in five. So um, let's, uh, let's choose our own adventure. I can tell you one of two things, but I don't have time for both. One could be some examples of why this is such an important formula. Two, I could try to explain the trace formula viewpoint of this. The trace formula viewpoint? OK, we have one vote for trace formula. OK, two votes for trace formula. I don't hear any votes in the other direction. That's democracy. No one's voting. OK. Uh, Fine, I'll, I'll give you one, one for application. OK, I will definitely do the application. It's a question of whether to do the application next time or not. Um, let me do the application now. And I'll give you the trace formula next time, because the trace formula is going to take a little bit of time if I, wanted, if I want to really give you a sense of what's going on. But the applications we can do very easily. So here's an application. I promise we'll get to the trace formula. Um, application. application of this formula, um, that this is equal to this. So this duality is extremely, um, well, the real application, which we, we can't get to here, it's basically equivalent to the functional equation for the Riemann zeta function. You don't know what Fe stands for. Functional equation for what we'll get to is the Riemann zeta function. But that's later. It's not really equivalent. OK, um, but let me give you a, a warm up to that. So let um, suppose, suppose we have a nice function f, and we're going to translate it in the multiplicative sense. So let f of t be f of t over x. Uh, x over t. So if you think of f of x as being some, like, let's say, a, a Gaussian or something, then f sub t, let's say t is large, if t is, I don't know, 100, then this will, um, where this used to be 1 and was already decaying, this is not yet 1. It's not 1 until x gets as large as t. So if t is large, what we've done is made a, a 
kind of fat version of, of this original F. Does everybody see that? So this was F, this is FT. So we need to work out what F hat T is. So, okay, by definition, it's the integral over the reals, F T X e to the minus two pi i x c d x. This, of course, is f of x over t. So let's make a change of variables. What's the change of variables we want? Yeah, OK, everybody sees. Re replace x by x times t. So then we get f of x. Of course, multiplying by t, t is some large positive number. Um, all we get here is e to the minus 2 pi i x c t. And what about dx? Brings out a factor of t. OK, everybody sees. Good. And this is nothing but the original Fourier transform, but not xc xc times t. And so what does this say? So now plus on summation, plus on summation tells us the following. When we sum over the integers f sub t of n, that is by, by what f is, it's just f of n over t, that will be the same as summing over the integers of the transform. And what we just worked out is that the Fourier transform is t times the Fourier transform multiplied by t. So here's a kind of, this is a, a really, really, really important formula. If you have a nice function and you sum over the integers n over t, you get the sum of the Fourier transforms at m times t. Now let's read this. So let's really, let, uh, let's take the, the case of f of x is a Gaussian, e to the minus 2 pi x squared. You remember what f hat is? It's the Gaussian again, right? Also a Gaussian. Yeah, exactly. It's its own Fourier transform. OK, so this is like super exponentially decaying. There's no problem in uh, evaluating any of these things. So on this side, how many terms are there? Say t equals 100. The number of terms before we get, I mean, there is some bulk. There is some bulk. How many terms until we get super, super close to 0, roughly? Well, once n over t is bigger than like 2, this thing is microscopic. OK, so let's say 1. So there's like 100 terms here. And then it, and then it totally dies down. How about here? How many terms? When m is equal to 1, t is 100. This thing is like 0 to 100 decimal places or, or 10,000 decimal places. There's no terms. It's just m equals 0. So you have packaged this sum that takes you many, many steps. And th th this gets much better as t gets larger. This is just t is 100 times. So, so this side is basically t. And f hat of 0 is, is 1. So it's just t. So this sum, so what we said is the sum e to the minus 2 pi n uh, squared over t squared over all n is, is like t with, you know, with an error that is vanishingly small. It's really, really close to t. It's really, really close to t. And we can really see this. Let's, let's see if we can really see this. 
Okay, does this make sense? So let's do a little experiment. No. So let's do a little experiment of this formula. Okay, f of x is e to the minus two pi x squared. Ah. Okay, so uh, plot f of x as x goes from what minus two to two. Okay, there's our nice, nice Gaussian. And now what I want to do is sum. So as a function, uh, let's sum, let's take the sum. So what would, how, how much partial sums? So let, let's say partial sum, partial sum given a natural number is, um, what do I want to do? Take the sum of F of uh, M over T. So there's going to be a parameter T. Maybe I'll put it here. Partial sum F of M over T as M ranges from minus N to N, right? That's the partial sum function. And so let's look at a list plot of this partial sum function of n, uh, t equals 100, as n goes from 1 to 100. I hope this works. Am I doing an awful lot of computation? I don't think so. I think list plot works a bit differently. You might want to put a table in there. Oh, say it again. So table of this, and then total or something. Uh, no, no, not not in the partial sum. Just in inside the list plot. So instead of having the range over n from one to ten be attached to the list plot, which I don't think recognizes it. If I'm remembering oh, oh, correctly. Oh, oh, oh. So what 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 happened? So say it again. So just enclose right table and then a square bracket and then put the other square bracket all the way at the end so that it encloses the argument. I think I see will work. Oh, good. Good, good, good. Maybe that's what was. Wait, 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 wait. Why is the, why is the back thing? This thing shouldn't be having any trouble. Okay. And now this, ah, would you look at that? So we're kind of slowly let's, let's, let's say this, uh, let's say we take a few more um, yeah, let's, let's take this to be a hundred. I think now it's going to work. So we're kind of slowly inching our way up. And if we go out to 200, we're really slowly approaching some value. Okay. And what is this value? So what is, um, partial sum of 200? Yeah, well, it's all of these things, but I, I mean, numerically. Okay, and what's the next term? The next term, so it's like we're approaching, uh, you know, this 70 or whatever. Um, there's something I wanted to say. This is over t squared. Right. So there's about 100 terms. And now what about on the other side? What about on the other side? So the partial sum two, partial sum two, which is on, on this side, is going to be t times a sum, it, the same Fourier transform, but now t times m. Okay, so let's look at the at two of these together. Uh, at this, can I list plot two things? Partial sum one and partial sum two. No, you you might have to put them in a list, I think. Actually, wait, that might give you coordinates. Oh, it worked. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, what's wrong? This is what I wanted to see. I wanted to see this hundred. There's some stupid thing. This is like the square root. Square root of a hundred, I think. Uh, square root of a hundred. Oh, duh. Uh, what I mean is. 
what do I mean? How come I'm not getting the, the number that I want here? I'm, I'm getting something that's converging. The theorem says these two things are the same. This is f of x. These are the partial sums as m goes from minus n to n. When I add up a whole bunch of these partial sums with t equals 100, I'm getting 70. Is there a factor on the Fourier transform if we're using, is it 2 pi? Is it usually pi that is the Fourier transform of itself? Ah, there's a pi and not a 2 pi. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's pi for the Fourier transform to be the same. And now that's 99.999. Thank you. And here's the first, the first sum, which takes, you know, on the order of 100 terms to get there. And the second sum, which is, you know, uh, if I take like partial sum two, partial sum two at one with 100. Ah, that one term, like it can't even evaluate the next order term because it's too small. It's, it's one, it's a hundred point, a thousand zeros or 10,000 zeros and a one, okay? So this is the power of duality. You have this sum that takes you a hundred terms to get there, or you have a sum that immediately tells you what the answer is and forever will be. So that's the uh, that's the power of Poisson summation in in this in this example. All right, we're out of time. Let me stop there.